This podcast would not be possible without the generous support of my patrons. I want to give a special shout out to Mary Thomas, Terry Smith, Bella Pori, John Munson, Dale Hozak, Andrew Goddard, Stephen Malio, Anna Lynn, Betsy Hodges, Holly Mack, Chris Bloom, Captain America, and Crystal Carroll. I appreciate you guys so much and thank you for the support. And if you want a shout out on the podcast, you can be in Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Let me hear from you. When I was seven years old, seven, my parents took me to my first concert. I always win this game at a bar. My first concert was Jimi Hendrix opening for the Monkees in 1967 at Forest Hills Tennis Stadium. And uh, that's how my rock and roll life began. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Set Lusting Bruce, your podcast all about Bruce Springsteen, his music, and mostly his fans. I am your host, Jesse Jackson. Joining me today is author, job guru, and Springsteen fan, Rob Burnett. Rob, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for this uh, surprising and fun invite. I love getting it, and it's great to meet you. Well, it is great to meet you, too. I, I do love that. Um, everyone, so I, I, majority of my interviews are just fans, and I say that as a just fans, as they are, they have all kinds of fascinating jobs, but being interviewed is not normally part of their gig, and every once in a while, I get someone who that is part of their job, but they tell me, I usually never get to talk about Bruce. I'm always talking about X. So this is kind of like a vacation. So I I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, All I ever wanted to do was talk about Bruce. I figured out how to turn that into a job, you know? That sounds perfect. Well, tell us a little about yourself. Well, let's see. Uh, You're talking to a media schmo who's been in just about every kind of showbiz there is from rock radio to MTV to VH1, back to radio to film, online video, podcasting, audiobooks, and puppet shows. And then I got stuck. Well, I never did puppet shows, but I got stuck in 2018 as a jerk without a job and accidentally found maybe the favorite mission of my life. I work as a headhunter now helping companies and people get into the best jobs. So that's my world. Well, let's talk Bruce. Absolutely. All right. So tell me, um, I always like to start at the beginning. When you grew up, what kind of music was your family listening to? Oh, well, that's an easy segue because, you know, they were Sinatra people, right? Okay. (laughs) You know, they were the Frank was kind of, you know, the the musical president of the household that I grew up in. And, uh, you know, my my parents were into all that stuff. They they were born. They were depression babies, you know, so Mm -hmm. so they came up through that kind of classic music realm. But I'll tell you this much. They were cool. Because when I was seven years old, seven, my parents took me to my first concert. I always win this game at a bar. My, oh, first, I bet. Con- my first concert was Jimi Hendrix opening for the Monkees in 1967 at Forest Hills Tennis Stadium. And uh, that's how my rock and roll life began. One of these things is not like the other is my first thoughts of Hendrix opening for the monkeys. Uh, Though I do have, I I went to see uh, one of uh, just a couple of months before Michael Nesmith passed, they were here in Dallas, the Mickey Dolenz and him were touring and uh, I saw it and it was a really good show. Yeah, it was a very good show. Um, Do you remember much of the show being that young? 
I remember two things. I remember what it would sound like right now if you and I cupped our two hands and put them over our ears. I remember that that's not only what it sounded like, but it sounded like that for about seven days after the concert, meaning yeah. audio was so terrible that I could barely hear anything for, for a week. Mm -hmm. And I also remember the visual of police officers in helmets with billy clubs or whatever those are called, beating kids who were trying to attack the stage and get to the monkeys. I remember that almost oh, funny, like violent visual, you know, mm -hmm. because it yeah. was a, a version of Beatlemania. Yeah. So did, as you grow into your teenage years, do you, did you reject your parents' music or did you just continue to embrace it, but expand your musical catalog? Well, they were just so good to me, right? They exposed me to all that stuff. So when I was seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, I started buying these thousands of records that are sitting behind me on this wall. And, yes. uh, you know, uh, they, they supported that uh, amazing love of mine. Uh, I started playing drums as a little kid. And I always say, if there's any proof that my mother loved me, it's the fact that we lived in apartment buildings where she let me play my drums. There's no other proof than that. <laughs> Book it. There you go. Right there. There that if there's if someone says, show me that your mom loves you. OK, here. I, I agree with that. That's wonderful. Um, so let's get into when did you first discover Bruce? And if you can, what about his music spoke to you? Well, I, I, there's a bunch of people to credit for that introduction. One of them was my stepmom, Kay. She mentioned it to me when I was about 13 or 14. The other uh, that I thought about getting ready to do this interview with you is my favorite disc jockey ever, a man named Vin Skelsa, V-I-N, and then his last name is S-C-E-L-S-A. And I grew up listening to Vin Skelsa on a radio station, on the radio station for rock and roll in New York at the time. It was WNEW-FM. And, and that man and his heart and his soul, Vin, turned me on to so many of my favorite, favorite artists, but especially Bruce. And then the first show that I got to see was at the Palladium in New York in 1976. And that was it. That was my religious conversion to Springsteen in that theater that night as a then 16 year old boy. I was hooked and that was that was it. I, I often call that the road to Damascus moment, right? That you became the light shines you and you, you open your eyes. Yeah, um, it's like when uh, Jake and Elvis walk into the church and see James Brown. That's it. Yeah, exactly. It has totally done that. What about him spoke to you? Why did you have that blinded by the light moment, if you pardon the pun? Well, I guess it, I have to then say that my first love before Bruce was the guy whose birthday I was born on, and that's Bob Dylan. So I, I became an obsessive Dylan fan before finding Springsteen. But when I found Bruce after Bob, that was kind of a holy duo there for me. You know, that was, that was I don't know, those were my, those were my two superheroes. And of course, Yes, there are similarities. And in the 70s, anybody that started to break as a great singer songwriter had to wear that terrible albatross around their neck as the new Dylan. There were so many people that that got that brand. But then, of course, back into that first concert experience, it, the live performance just shook my soul. I I'm a guy in my 
in my early years as a young kid, I used to bootleg every single concert that I went to on, on Memorex cassettes. And uh, every time I saw Springsteen, I would record it. And, and when I listened back to those recordings, it took my brain and my soul back into that live experience. I remember the first time I saw him when he, he jumped off the stage into the crowd and you know was singing from the floor surrounded by fans. I mean, I'd never seen anything like that before. And I just got, you know, my body felt it. Mm. I, uh, I, I know the feeling, absolutely. Um, so you've already mentioned uh, bootlegging and everything. I always like to preface this question, Bob, with the amount of times you've seen Bruce live is not a fair barometer of how big of a fan you are. There are people who've never had the luck to see him. There are other people that, you know, because they live in the East Coast and because of their age, you know, have seen him hundreds of times. So talk to me about, do you count the number of times you've seen him? <laughs> no, I don't. So how many? Okay. I don't count, so I can't, I can't give you a number, but I can tell you that from the first tour, 1976, till the last tour, which I guess in the United States ended in 2016, I believe I've seen every single tour and twice on Broadway, okay. but I could I could never give you a number. <laughs> okay, That's, yeah, a, a lot of people can't. And according to Dave Marsh, who um, made the joke when I ran into him um, at a show once, um, he said, "If you can count it, if you can count, you aren't a true fan." Which huh. I think he slightly meant that with just you know tongue in cheek. I hope. Uh, oh, he's, he's, yeah. he's snarky. Let's call Dave snarky, shall we? Let's. I, I think that is a kind statement to say. Absolutely, yes. Hey, I'll tell you this much. I interviewed Dave. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, during college radio, that was one of my my first uh, moments inside the inner circle. Was okay. my interview with Dave Marsh. Mm -hmm. And anything you want to share? Well, you know, he had written one of the early books about Bruce. So, yes. so, so that probably happened late seventies when I was in college radio, but then in 1979, I became uh, the New England college rep for CBS records, which meant Columbia records and Epic records. So mm. my first, sort of kind of job in the industry was a job that I got for one sole purpose, which was to meet Bruce Springsteen. And so that happened fatefully just after, within a night or two, after John Lennon was murdered. And oh, please that, share that story. And so that was the first night that I met Bruce Springsteen I got to go backstage at a gig. I, I got to look this up. The fans are going to get mad at me if I screw it up. But I think we were in Rhode Island, I think. I don't know. We'll have to look up the history. But here's the story. I go backstage. I know I'm going to meet Bruce for the first time. And on the night that John Lennon was murdered, Earlier that day, John sat for what was his last ever interview. And the interview with John and Yoko went for hours. I believe it was about a three hour interview. I was working in radio at the time. And because of that, I had access to that interview. And I heard it and fans will remember that in John Lennon's last ever interview, they asked him about what it was like before he and Yoko recorded Double Fantasy when he had essentially been retired from the music business for about five years. So Lennon said that he sent his assistant out to go buy them all the current music 
that was out at the time so that they could understand the rock and roll world that they were re-entering. And he mentioned how the B-52s made an impression on him because it connected to him. It connected John to so much of what he loved musically about Yoko. And then John Lennon calls out Hungry Heart and said that that song spoke to him in a way that really made him smile because it, if you listen to Hungry Heart and then you listen to Just Like Starting Over from John Lennon, you'll hear the connection. And I can't remember Lennon's words, but I certainly remembered them last night, that night, sorry. So the night that I go backstage, there's a tiny group with John Landau, Bruce, two or three others. And I decided to take one of the greatest risks of my life. I thought, there's a possibility that Bruce doesn't know this because back in 1980, we didn't hear everything that happened in real time 24 seven. So they introduced me to him and I start briefly telling him that John Lennon said these things about Bruce in the final interview. And I felt there, there was a hush in that circle. I felt John Landau looking at me saying, I can't believe you're saying this. And Bruce had his head down looking at the ground. He listened to what I said. I told him that Lennon spoke about him and that I thought Bruce would want to know. And then he put his hand on my shoulder and he looked at me and said, thank you. And it was one of the greatest moments of my life. That was the first of, you know, many encounters, but, but one that I'll, I'll never, ever forget because I just, I don't know, Bruce was in the same agony that the rest of us were, but in a different sense, because he had to get on stage and perform a night or two after Lennon was killed. And imagine if you and I were in that boat, what, how difficult that must have been. Yeah, it's the old showtime, right? Like, OK, I've got yes. to put aside all the pain and, and the personal because there are people out there that are wanting to hear us. And and I also think partly. And, and it's not my place to I am putting my emotion onto their feelings, I think. I, if I were the E Street Band, if I were a member of the band, I would go, there's, there's nothing more healing than playing music. And so we will heal, we will help the audience heal, and it's the way John Lennon would have wanted it. Beautiful. Right? Beautiful. And, and of course, on the last E Street Band tour, when we were losing heroes on what seemed like a nightly basis. Yes, they opened with Prince. They opened with, uh, um, what was the other artist that we lost at the time? We lost Prince. We lost Bowie. We lost Glenn Fry. These all happened yes. on the last E Street Band tour. And, yeah. and you what, what, said it much better than I could possibly say it. But there was a lot of healing going on through all that pain. You know, I... Uh my little small regret is um you know i grew up in a in a in a small town my dad was in the army so we moved around a lot but we spent a lot of time at my grandparents dairy farm in louisiana and um go gospel music and country music were the only two things i heard right i mean you know it that was it and um to this day when i think of merle haggard I think of my father, Johnny Cash, I think of my father. And when Merle Haggard passed away, it felt like I lost my father all over again. And I was, I unrealistically, I wanted Bruce to do a Merle Haggard song, you know, and he <laughs> didn't. And it's not fair for me to expect every time someone of musical significance passes that um, Bruce gives a tribute but I, I was there at the show when they he covered Bowie and then the world you know they released that free video of them doing Purple Rain with every member of the East Street Band wearing something of purple um, I just recently had someone on the show that adored Prince uh, and were they not they weren't a Springsteen fan at all and I was able to send them that link 
similar to like you, you know, being able to share that story to Bruce, I was able to say, hey, have you heard this? No. And I sent it to him and they sent back, they said, oh my goodness, thank you so much for sharing that with me. I, I, I don't know how I had not seen that. Um, well, we, can't, we can't touch that moment without sending praise and love to Nils Lofgren. Oh, absolutely. Because that was one of the most powerful live performances ever. And I was in that room in Brooklyn and I'll never forget it. Oh, love, you were at that show? Love Nils, love Nils, oh, yes. love Nils. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, promotion uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, I've got a couple of people joining me, Rachel, Rachel and Mark, and we're going to do an episode just praising Nils. We're hey, just, yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah, so he's, <laughs> he's just, yeah, he's, I, I'm in the process of re-listening to Bruce's autobiography. And I just, um, I, I was just a couple of days ago rehearing the chapter of Niels and him talking about joining the band. And uh, it was such a beautiful story. And, and he's been such a gift to the E Street Band. Um, he's an know. angel. He's an angel. He truly is. You know, the other thing, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Rob, be, as someone who's been a fan so long. So my first show wasn't until 2002, just because of a lot of circumstances. Um, but so I, I'm, <clears throat> I pick up the No Nukes, you know, set, the CD and the DVD or the Blu-ray, right? And I'm watching it and I'm loving it, but I'm going, the stage looks so empty compared to what it is now, right? Because now then we have Niels and little Steven plus Patty plus Susie. And so any thoughts on that, that it is, you know, the E Street Band now forget when they're doing like wrecking ball tour where they have the whole horn section and background singers just the quote-unquote core e street band now is this massive band but in the late 70s it they look so tiny compared to what they are now yeah well look it's an ever-changing uh collection of people that have been in and out and back in again this yeah. band over all these years, you know? So uh, that's one of the beautiful things about Bruce. There's a short list of artists, really a short list, who've been able to reimagine, reinvent, and reinvent and really explore different kinds of music, album to album to album. There's not a long list of artists who are able to do it. And I'll also say able to get away with it on major record labels that don't usually like it when an artist decides to take a left turn and a right turn. So it takes a lot of business bravery. And let's also say great management and a great team to be able to explore something as different as all the explorations that Bruce has taken us on. And, and that oftentimes means different people are playing behind him. Um, I, I'm always interested that the dark years so obviously you've been a fan for a while if you can share a little bit your feelings when it's the late 80s you hear bruce has fired the band it <laughs> is you know and then maybe talk about when the reunion tour happened kind of give me that 10 year summary if if you could well, and, and, i was i was on the inside man i was on oh, the inside talk to me about because, this how how were you on the inside because, because of well, all the yeah i started i started a 12 year career at mtv and vh1 in the late 80s oh okay tell and, me about that yeah and and so when <laughs> there's good and bad to this okay first okay. i'll speak as a fan i'll answer okay. your question as a fan okay when i heard that bruce springsteen was no longer going to work with the e street band 
I wasn't furiously angry at him, but I was furiously destroyed as a fan. Sure. It just ripped me up on the inside. And as the child of divorced parents, it kind of felt like that. It felt like that horrible wound yeah. to the rock and roll baby boy that someone had just broken up my family. Well, then Bruce announces uh, Human Touch in Lucky Town. Yes. And now as a professional working at MTV, I get the chance to be one of the producers of the first real serious television documentary on Bruce Springsteen. We called it the MTV Rockumentary, hosted okay. by Kurt Loder, who was uh, my partner in crime. I used to sit next to Kurt for years and years and years at MTV. And, you know, we got to work very, very closely with Bruce at the time. But of course he was with, all right, I won't be too mean. Let's just call him the other band, right? <laughs> Those other guys. And and uh, so so we, we did that rockumentary and you could probably click all around YouTube and find a copy to view of this if you've never seen it because it was a it was an incredible experience to work with them. But then after working with Bruce, when the E Street band was, let's call it decommissioned, yeah. that's when I really got uh, the chance to form close both personal and professional relationships with three of the guys in the band. I got very close with Max. I got close with Nils. I, no, four. Max, Nils, spent a lot of time with Clarence and then really got to spend a lot of time with little Steven. Eventually, that leads to my first wedding. And who plays? Who's my wedding singer? Southside Johnny. Wow. <laughs> So, so when the E Street Band was not together as a unit, there was time to do a lot of other things. And Stephen produced, of course, many of, of, of the great uh, creations with Southside Johnny. But in 91, when that record came and it's been a long time and all the great stuff that was on that record from, from John, uh, I guess partly because, yeah, I was a guy working at MTV. I asked for the biggest favor of all time. And Bobby Bandier and Southside Johnny played our wedding, which let's just say gave a lot of my best friends one of the great musical nights of all time. I bet. Yeah. Dude. That was a trip. But, yeah. but, but the longest, longest answer to your question is when they got back together. Yes. <laughs> That's like having your parents say, sorry, we shouldn't have got divorced. We're really, really, really sorry. We, we love you. We're all back. So I, I can't, I, I, I had a guest on and I love this story. Um, and I, I wish I could remember his name because I tell the story often on the show, but he said he was at one of the reunion shows and he was enjoying, he was feeling the love and the music, you know, just fill him like waves. And he says he remembers thinking, this is it. This is the ultimate Springsteen moment that they've broken up. They've come back. It will never get better than this. He said, I, I, Maybe they'll tour every few years like a greatest hits tour, but my fandom with Bruce Springsteen has reached its apex. And, and he continues, he goes, and Jesse, I feel like I want to go back to that young guy in 99 and go, you ain't seen nothing yet. We have the rising. We have the magic. We have a worldwide river tour coming. We have Bruce on Broadway. We have an autobiography. We have a album that comes out during a pandemic. This is, this is at the end. This is halftime. So <laughs> thoughts on that, Bob? Well, you know, 
I was interviewing Nils on one of the last nights of the tour in 2016. Okay. And that's when they really broke the record with those four hour plus shows. People thought that that used to happen all the time, but it really yeah. only happened in the latter part of the last tour, 2016, which ended internationally in 2017. But, but I asked Nils and I said, are we, is losing Prince and losing Bowie and losing so many of our heroes somehow connected to this idea of playing endlessly in these performances. And, and I, I hopefully asked the question worded much better yeah. than that, but I, I, I know I did, I'm rambling now, but, but sure. Nils, Nils said, and I'm of course paraphrasing, that Bruce feels at this point in their lives and at this point in their careers, the fact that they are in as good a shape as possible means they have to do this. They have to give it their all while they still can. And, you know, I bet you that secretly, <laughs> secretly, some members of the E Street Band probably sound like my ancient Jewish grandparents going, oi, oi, do we have to play this many hours? Well, but, I know. But, but I think that yeah. there's some kind of a religious, spiritual, missionary aspect to it um, that, that, that drives Bruce to, as he's always done from the beginning, put it all out there. And I just cannot freaking wait for these first U.S. shows um, to, to see what we get this time. But but they just, you know, can't stop, won't stop. And it, it's beautiful to see. It's inspiring as hell. I saw a little Steven. I, I can't remember if it was on Twitter or a quick interview, but he talked about that um, just recently, like four hours. Woo! Three. Let's let's stick to three, which yeah. which is hilarious, <laughs> right? Because most and, and I say this with no, uh, I, I'm not throwing as the kids say shade to anyone, right? A lot of musicians, ninety minutes, maybe you know, maybe right at two hours. That's a show, right? And the idea that little Steven is like, hey, let's stick to three. <laughs> is still such a gift when they're right, it's still 70. twice as much as normal right yes exactly <laughs> uh, yeah are you going Good to question. any europe shows are you going are uh you not sure not sure i haven't bought tickets for that yet you know maybe we'll see okay. what, what life uh brings you know next year it, it's interesting now that you know tickets go on sale so far in advance yes of, uh when these shows actually happen, but sometimes I'm more of a last minute guy. I went to see The Who kind of at the last minute a couple of weeks ago at Madison Square Garden, and it was just a great experience. You know, it's funny, Bob, is I I've had a couple of people reach out to me. Bob, not Bob, don't, you can't, I, if you start calling me Bob, I'm gonna start calling you <sighs> something else. <laughs> I am, that, yes, I am so sorry, Rob. I, I don't know what, <laughs> yes, it's early yet. So, Rob, the I've had people reach out to me that say, "What? When are they going to announce? When are they going to announce?" I'm like, "Okay, it's June. The rumor is they're not starting till February. I mean, that's you know how much advance. Obviously, start saving your money, but you know it's okay that they don't. I, I know we're just all anxious about when are they going to play and what cities and and start touring." So absolutely. Yeah. Any minute now we'll know. I think so too. Um, so just for a few minutes and then we'll get back to music. Um, you did write next job, best job. So talk to me a little bit about how you, with your background in working for MTV and VH1 and working in music and the record companies, how the heck did you end up being a a headhunter a, a job 
you know, a a, a one man staffing agency, you know, a, a, you know, well, this happened. It happened completely by accident. You know, I had this great journey in uh, rock and roll and radio and TV and all the rest. But like so many people, I got stuck. And uh, in 2018, I was sending out resumes and getting back crickets. Yeah. And I was reaching out to everyone I knew and getting ghosted. And it was freaking me out because I have a lot of mouths to feed. So one morning, in the summer of 2018, I grabbed my iPhone, I pressed record, and I made a short little two minute video about the agony of being out of work. And I posted it on LinkedIn and Facebook first thing in the morning. By the time it got to the first night, underneath the video, there were 600 lengthy comments and 16,000 views. People were saying stuff like, oh, my God, or oh, my effing God, you just said exactly what I'm going through, but didn't have the courage to admit publicly. So it really struck a nerve. And I woke up the next day and the next day and the next day, and I kept making these short little videos, posting them online. After about eight days of it, a guy called and said, listen, I met you at MTV 100 years ago. I run my own business now, and I need to hire a chief operating officer. Are you a headhunter? Is that what you do? And I went, yes. And then I muted his call and I started searching on Google words like headhunter, recruiter, retainer, fee, commission. And I swear to you, Jesse, I faked my way through the phone call and realized that I was being gifted a new career that I never saw coming but one that's based completely on helping other people find the jobs that they want and doing it in a number of weeks instead of months and months and months of bullshit and red tape that normally happen. And one of the ways that I do that, no offense to any Springsteen fans listening that might be in human resources, but I'm too old for human resources. They take too long. So when I work as a headhunter, the companies agree to hire me exclusively and there can be no HR reps in the way. So I just talk only to the hiring manager at a company and instead of filling their email with dozens or hundreds of resumes, I pre-qualify everybody, I interview everybody and send just a small number of candidates that are perfectly qualified to fill that role. And then my staff and I run the process start to finish. So we can do this quickly instead of the old way, which takes for fricking ever. You know? So, uh, so much there that I, 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 you know, I'm looking for the heart icon that we have, you know, on social media. Um, one, um, I love the, and I say this sarcastically, the um, canned email that basically, you know, that says, wow, you have incredibly, you know, you have very impressive credentials. At this time, we feel like you are not a good fit for our company, which is their version of, oh, it's, it's, it's not you, it's me. You know, yeah, we're going email. in another direction, which I always say is south. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, then the other thing is um, when you're looking for a job, it, and like I said, I, I spent nine months unemployed in such a effed up way. I ended up because so many people. And once again, I'm going to echo your words. No offense to our HR brethren that are doing the best they can. Um, and I'm sure I'm not talking about you. But if I'm going to put a generalization, there is no follow-up whatsoever. So you reach the point when you're looking for a job, Rob, that I'm actually grateful when someone calls me or sends me an email that says, hey, Jesse, we ended up going with somebody else. 
thank you. They, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly disappointed I don't get the job, but now I'm not sitting there thinking this is still in play. This is still in play. Um, and God, the, the wheels, you are right, turn so, so slowly. Right. And, and so it, it is truly one of the this is a great calling that you're doing. And I applaud it because I've been Thanks. there and felt the pain. It is so hard. Yeah. Well, the least we can do is respond to each other in some kind of yeah. reasonable fashion. You know, it, yeah. it's, uh, as Bruce used to say, in some fashion, <laughs> just. <respond>. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, talk about the book. Well, the book was as accidental as the career. Uh, when I started making these daily videos as a headhunter, one of those videos was spotted by a literary agent. And he said, this is a book. And I said, it's a book if you sell it. It's a book if you pay me to write it. Yes. And, uh, this wonderful man named Rick Richter, who's a very experienced literary agent, found me, helped me, guided me and sold our book to a major publisher. So that came out within this last year. And uh, the book is just filled with hundreds of tips and tricks to make that hiring process go as quickly as it can. And next job, best job is That's the name it. of the book, right? All right, yeah. so available wherever where you wherever can find- Wherever books are sold, yeah. yes. Whether it's <laughs> But I'll say this, I'll say this. Yes. If a Springsteen fan is listening to this podcast and you want a free digital copy, just find me on social media and I'll, I'll send you one for free. Well, I will raise my hand right now and send that to me. <laughs> so that sounds good. Uh, we may have to talk offline about me ordering a physical copy that I can have you autograph. Uh, all right. So back to Bruce. Uh, you mentioned you were able to go to, did you go to the original Broadway run or did you go to the second one as well? Yes and yes. Okay, great. Yeah, F uh, fifth row center and sixth row center. And, and the thing that I'll remember the most about being in those two different rooms on Broadway were the moments when Bruce walked away from the microphone because it wasn't really needed and right. just spoke to us. Yes. That was that was thrilling. You know, because I, you know, because of my career, I've been in other rooms, like when Bruce did storytellers for us at VH1, you know, with this tiny little audience, which for me is still one of the rarest and most magical musical experiences any of us can have. I agree. Which is seeing one of your favorite artists, especially the ones that play stadiums, not my favorite way to see music ever, ever, ever. Sure. And when, and when you see one of the biggest artists in the world who play stadiums, when you see that artist in a tiny room with a small amount of people, that's, that's as close as I've gotten to seeing God. So you must have been then involved with two of, I think that many people, right, the, um, the unplugged, which became plugged with plugged. the other band. Yeah, you got to yes. cross out the UN. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. I was there. I was there. Yes, that's a great show. Uh, wonderful. You know, and I do think... Um, the biggest that was problem. John Landau. John Landau made us break the rule. You oh, know? really? Tell me yeah, that story. We, 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 well, because we had that. This was a big, big hit series for us, right? And there was negotiating and negotiating and negotiating, and it came yeah. down to Landau saying, "We're not doing it." You know, so yeah. cross out, cross out the U and the N, and we'll do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do think that the other band has the weight of not being the e street band you know and if you take I think them, yes <laughs> if you look if you try to not grade them on that curve you know uh, i i didn't attend to any of those shows but i have i've seen the unplug the plug special i've certainly bought my share of the nugs and you know they sounded good 
and and better days is one of my favorite songs so you know oh, I, I love great that great songs on both of those albums i love yeah. the song living proof is one of yes. my favorite songs there's great songs on those records yeah yeah and i you know my always my hope is that during the tour we get one of those or something you know that maybe just, so let me ask yeah. you this question i know we're almost out of time yeah. but you're as an expert Tell me if this rumor is true, because I've always heard this rumor and I've always, always secretly hated Sting because of it. People have told me that it was Sting that took Bruce aside, I think, on an amnesty tour and said, maybe don't work with the E Street Band. I think I've I don't know if that's true I've or always not. Heard rumor that it's Sting's fault. Uh, well, I don't know if that's true or not. I know in the book, he, right, he talks about how because I, I said, I'm just re-listening to that, that they had, <clears throat> my words, not his, they had developed an unhealthy codependent relationship, right? Like he was the boss, he was the father, he was the banker, he was everything to all the members of the band, partly because he wanted it that way. And there was this um, kind of almost unhealthy relationship and they, you know, they cut it off. I know that little Steven has said in multiple interviews and you, I don't know if you've interacted with him, maybe he shared that with you, that going back and they tell the current bands, you don't have to break up. You just take a break, go do things, but keep that band there to come back in. Well, and, look, look at the way, look at the way Pearl Jam's doing it, right? They're yeah. doing it with uh, pretty easily in and out and, yeah. and Jeff Tweedy and Wilco. So you're right. Yeah. There, there's plenty of examples of, I'll use a weird word, fluidity. Is that yes. right? <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> there's uh, fluidity. Uh, hey, I don't want to end this okay. interview without two really important shout outs that are part of my Bruce life please. Uh, one of them has been part of my Bruce life since I was a teenage boy. And the other has been part of my Bruce life in just the last few years. The, the one that's been with me for the longest time is the fact that when I would see Bruce many, many, many years ago, Bruce near the end of the shows would encourage us as we walked out to look for people with red buckets and go help the food banks in the towns and areas and Absolutely. communities that he played in. So that turned me on to an organization called Why Hunger. It's spelled W-H-Y, whyhunger.org, founded by Bill Ayers and Harry Chapin. And I've been working with this organization now for the last five or six years, but Bruce has done so much good work through my friends at Why Hunger that I couldn't visit with you without asking people who listen to this podcast to go to whyhunger.org and take a look at what we do. Bruce is our, our greatest helper. And in the last few years, I met one of the greatest fan groups in the history of planet Earth. And I'm sure you know who the Spring Nuts are. Absolutely. Oh, I got to meet the Spring Nuts. Yes. And Howie, who's the, uh, what does he call himself? Howie the Warden. Himself the Warden of the yes. Spring Nuts. These are some of the most loving, generous people of all time. We've been doing these benefits with them and Why Hunger because each year the Spring Nuts take over the Stone Pony in Asbury Park, New Jersey for what used to be one day, which is now a whole weekend of Asbury Park activities. So listen to what happened. Yes. The Spring Nuts just a few weeks ago donated $33,000 to Why Hunger because of our collective love of Bruce Springsteen, it's going to make me cry just to say it out loud, but I, I couldn't finish this podcast without sending all of my love to the Spring Nuts and to Why Hunger for what they've just done, because it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It, it truly is beautiful, uh, Rob. And I've had Howie on the show multiple times. Um, truly is just a, a lovely, lovely person. And, and, one of the most generous guys yes. I've, I've ever met. And also, we, we share a mutual love of Barry Manilow. 
<laughs> I, I'm gonna have Howie on. We're gonna do a Barry Manilow episode soon. Look at that! Wow, yeah. you, you just you just caught me off guard there. Yeah, uh, but <laughs> you know the other thing that I really, really I love about the Spring Nuts is Howie is a loving, caring man. Everyone on the show, everyone in that group is, and I love how very quickly. Because there's always a slight percentage of jerks that when you're in a group and that is not tolerated in that Facebook group, that is he. Maybe Howie should become the head of Twitter. Screw yes. Elon, let's get yes. Howie to run oh, Twitter. <laughs> the world would be in such a better life, wouldn't it? Hey, get step aside, Musk. Yes. And I will tell you, when I saw that Bruce sent that quick video well, thanking that, them. that 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 was magic if people don't know what we're talking about yeah my friends at why hunger asked bruce to surprise the spring nuts yeah uh and and maybe we can put a link to that video I with will. this podcast for people that haven't seen it that was a fucking moment right there <laughs> it was it was so it, it and yeah i i just i love that Howie and everyone else and there's a lot of people that work on that and Howie is the quick to tell you that it's not him it's the group oh but it's, every it's working so many but that was yeah. a full circle moment right yeah. that was that was the moment that they've been waiting for and it was a surprise that some of my yeah. friends created for them mm -hmm. uh that just you know so just, just opens your heart it yeah, opens your heart we are running out of time Please come back. Let's we we didn't even we barely touched on your time at MTV and VH1. I would love to hear more about how you got involved in World Why Hunger, some stories of that, different things. I, I feel like we've just scratched the surface. And uh, unfortunately, this is my fault. I have a hard stop that I, I'm doing another podcast in a few minutes. Hey, so, thanks for doing this, man. I really, no, this it's, is, it's we, we super, need to do this again. Super fun, surprising yeah. invite. Yeah. Happy to meet you. Happy to do it. Yeah. So um, two things before I let you go. One, any final thoughts and how to reach you? Oh, that's easy. So uh, final thoughts. I can't wait to see Letter to You and Ghosts and all these songs that we've never seen in concert before. I can't wait to see it because I love, love that album. And I'm the easiest guy to find ever. The best way is just go to my website, robbarnettmedia.com. Barnett is B-A-R-N-E-T-T. -T. And uh, I'm all over all the social medias. So you'll find me in my bald head. And I'd be happy to say hi to anybody who wants to connect it is rob not bob or else he'll call <laughs> you out and i i uh and i appreciate that and also so here i end every episode with the mary question so jay armstrong who is the honors english teacher recently retired in the philadelphia area would spend two days breaking apart thunder room as as a poem his seniors would just break it apart look at all the lyrics talk about the themes and at the end of the two days he asked the question does mary get in the car Bob <laughs> Barnett, that is what your a, question what does a great mary question of course mary climbs in because the guy gets the girl and the girl gets the guy what a I, great question i love it thank you so much all right listeners you uh we are going to have rob back again i i just i i I feel like we could have talked three hours. Uh, thank you, sir. Go get vaccinated. Go get boosted. Go to the Why Hunger uh, website. These are great people doing uh, good work, as Bruce used to say, right, at the end of every show. Check them out. And uh, for now, let's all be kind to each other because that's how we're going to get through this. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, listeners. We'll talk to you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>